Coming at you from Los Angeles, this is Mobility Revolution, powered by Hire Car. We're going to take you on a journey through the unique business models and income opportunities that Mobility as a Service has to offer. From selling cars to sharing scooters, you'll learn how you fit in to the Mobility Revolution. Hey everyone, and welcome to the first episode of Mobility Revolution Powered by Hire Car. We're your hosts, Nate Ryan. And I am Reese Moulton. Reese, today's a really exciting day, isn't it? It really is. I'm, <laughs> I'm pumped. Yeah, we have a very special guest with us this week, Brian Allen, a longtime automotive biz celebrity coming straight out of retirement after over 30 years with the largest dealer group in the U.S., Galpin Motors. Brian teamed up with Hire Car to help educate dealers on how they can turn age or idle inventory into new revenue streams. Brian, it's really great to have you with us today. Well, thank you. Kind of like the walking dead. Is that what you're saying? (laughs) Out of retirement? Yep. So yes, the second half of my life. Um, But yes, indeed, I I did. You know, what uh, I recognized is that in the news, almost every day you hear about the death of a dealership. And it was really upsetting me because dealerships are near and dear to my heart in that uh, provided a good living for me and solved a lot of people's transportation problems. So anything that I can do to help increase the perception and the longevity of dealerships, I figured, you know what, I'll go back to work and see what I can do. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we're stoked to have you on. Thanks again for coming in. Uh, but yeah, I tuned into your, your webinar last week with uh, Northland Securities, and uh, you mentioned uh, something about, you know, that experiencing several pain points as a dealer, you know, during your time with Galp. And um, you think you could touch on maybe a few of those and, and maybe, you know, explain a couple of the early opportunities that you envisioned through mobility as a service while you were there? Certainly. Um so the great thing is, is I come from the perspective of a dealer because I was for over 30 years. And the what we know is, is that certainly there are processes at dealerships that are antiquated. You know, it shouldn't take six years, six hours to buy a car. That was a Freudian slip. <laughs> uh, but what I know is there there are pain points that I experienced as a dealer that were manifested financially. And just to give you a few Dealers have to carry a lot of inventory, and that's a pain point because in the day and age of virtual inventory and digital inventory, the car business is one that there's still a lot of physical cars, and with that comes some expense, real estate, uh, bank financing, floor, otherwise known as flooring. The dealers have to insure the cars while they're on the lot because while the risk may seem low, there could be hail and all kinds of crazy stuff, but cars on the lot are expensive. And the one unique thing that is uh, typical of all dealerships is they tend to stay idle until they're sold. So there are dealerships with hundreds to thousands of cars. And as the ride share and mobility movement has started to gain, obviously a lot of traction since Uber 2012, um, an opportunity has come where ride share drivers need more vehicles than ever before, because there's more rideshare drivers. But something's happened. There's a lot of these drivers that don't have a car. So I go back to the pain point and I say, here I am, a dealer that's sitting with inventory, and there are drivers that need a car. Now, the pain point is the dealer's paying all these expenses, the car's not driving, the dealer's incurring full depreciation, no offsetting revenue, but there's a rideshare driver out there. Well. I take that and I say, how can we put those two together and solve a problem for the rideshare driver and solve a problem for the dealer? So the one pain point is to earn revenue off of idle inventory and especially aged inventory. The other is, is that for dealers that want to get into rideshare, technology is important to let others know, rideshare drivers specifically, that they have inventory for them. And I came across Hire Car, obviously. I said, boy, you've got amazing technology. And we can expand on that a little bit because Hire Car started peer-to-peer and still does do peer-to-peer. Right. But boy, the dealers have this inventory. If we can figure out how it makes sense to let drivers know that this inventory is available, earn revenue on it, and then something more spectacular, sell these drivers' cars. And 
right now a pain point for dealers is it's tough to let the rideshare community know that dealers can help them buy a car. Got it. Kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, so you and I recently just went to the E4 Mobility Summit, um, and you kind of just mentioned this already, how new mobility companies see this shift in mobility as sort of the death of the dealer. Um, but it was it was great to see you up there on that panel because you have a drastically different view of how, how people are actually – uh, or how dealers are making this shift to mobility. Um, and you you mentioned that you know the rideshare industry is a is a good way for dealers to start leveraging you know this age and idle inventory. Um, but how do you envision dealers fully taking advantage of mobility as compared to the other mobility companies out there that think the dealer's going to die? Very good. Um, as you said, I started with saying, "Gee, there's so many." pundits out there that say dealers are like dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. They're the walking dead. Um, What I believe is that if there's anybody who is in position to leverage the mobility movement, it is the dealership. And a few primary reasons. Dealers already have the inventory, the resources, the people, and access to financing and insurance Mm -hmm. that others, if they try to enter the mobility industry, They have to start fresh, and it takes a lot of money. If you have to buy real estate in 2019 dollars compared to the average dealer that owns real estate from probably 1970s dollars and later, Mm -hmm. earlier, uh, the dealer has a tremendous advantage. Also, if the dealer is sitting on idle inventory, any dollar they get additional is revenue versus a third party, whether they're, they're a large rental agency or some new transportation company that comes in, they uh, they have to earn a lot of revenue just to overcome their new expenses. A dealership party, their expenses are typically paid by the parts and service department, used car department, and to some degrees, a uh, new car department. Mm-hmm. But the vast majority of their expenses are paid for. So if you take the position that a dealer can offer a vehicle at really no investment in um, capital investment, I should say, well, they can undercut any larger outside mega company that's trying to enter this mobility Mm -hmm. world. And already we've seen some challenges with some people who've failed in mobility because the expenses to start today are extremely expensive. Right. And again, the dealer has it. So I think as the shift happens and the dealers are educated Mm -hmm. that there are platforms like HireCar, and HireCar is the only platform I know that does peer-to-peer and dealer uh, small fleets and large fleets, but that this this is a turnkey solution that a dealer can turn on and let the rideshare community know that they can get vehicles. Nobody can beat a dealer. So you you mentioned that dealers make a lot of profit off their parts and service business. Um, with working with a company like Hire Car and Rideshare Drivers, is there an advantage for dealers to be able to continue leveraging the parts and service departments of their business? Yeah. So, and I, I would just correct you a little bit. It's not a lot of profit. I, right. Um, one thing I do like to clarify, dealers actually, at best, a good dealer makes about 2% net margin. It's it, it's a lot of volume mm-hmm. to sell, to make money. Got so. It. There is a perception out there that dealers make money hands over fist, and it's not really accurate. Uh, but parts and service is a large part of covering the expenses of mm-hmm. a dealership. And then used cars is second to that, and then new cars last. But um, to go back to your point, rideshare drivers are the ultimate customer. If you think about it, they typically need an oil change every two months, mm-hmm. maybe brake pads once a twice a year. So dealers that embrace the rideshare community in parts and service have a wealth of opportunity. And once again, they can be the most competitive because their capital investments already been made and often paid for. So what do dealers need to do? They need to be open a little bit later, at least once a week. We have some stores that open 24 hours once or twice a a week to accommodate Mm -hmm. commercial and rideshare. Mm -hmm. Uh, some We have some dealers that are making lounges for rideshare drivers to rest, to get on the internet, to do a little bit of business. Most rideshare drivers have another gig going. 
In fact, uh, Lyft just publicized in their S1, 90% of rideshare drivers, their rideshare drivers, are part-time and drive less than 20 hours a week. So they've got a lot going on. And if they can, we can give them a little kind of we work office yeah. as a dealer, <laughs> Yep, even better. Yeah, that's a little different than the the notion that rideshare drivers are actually putting, you know, what is it, like 200 to 400 miles per day. Right, right. And, well, I, I know that from the data at Hire Car and my personal experience that when rideshare started in 2012 with Uber, mm -hmm. The typical rideshare driver was more of a disenfranchised taxi or limo driver. Mm -hmm. Today, we have retired law enforcement, uh, semi-retired uh, people in, in government service, postal workers, uh, teachers, people that are now working three or four hours a day supplementing their income. And some are retired living on a pension and just want to get out of the house. The husband or the wife want to get away from each other. It's kind of funny. But <laughs> But it's 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 a whole different dynamic, which yeah. works really well for dealers. Exactly. Right. Really well. I guess to kind of touch on that. So, I mean, it's it's fairly obvious that dealers might be a bit hesitant to get involved with like the ride sharing or the on demand industry because ride share drivers have had that like negative stigma to them in the past. How would you say, um, you know, that has changed over the last five or six years? So what I, I certainly know is <clears throat> and this is a pretty interesting statistic. Uh, Bloomberg just had reported that in 2012, I take that back, 2013, Uber by themselves were doing 120,000 rides a day. Sounds like a lot. Mm -hmm. February 2019, just a little over five years later, Uber's doing 15 million rides a day. Wow. But that's not even the best part. In Uber's S1 filing for going public, they said their target is 30 million rides a day by 2022. So that's just three years away. So what has happened to, to have the workforce mm -hmm. to have that many rides a day? They've had to expand two part-time workers and made it very convenient for these drivers to work a few hours a day and have their regular gig, whether, exactly. whatever that is. The stigma has also gone away from being a rideshare driver. I know that I get in cars today, they have seat covers, steering wheel covers, Kleenex boxes, some are selling candies and, and bottled water or even offering them complimentary. Yep. Right. Well, now with all the rise of all these new services that actually allow you to, you know, put catered boxes into the into the vehicles already. Right. It's really kind of elevating the whole experience for right. everyone. Exactly. So so the driver, which goes back to they're more comfortable because they're more proud yep. to be doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. This isn't just a taxi. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was in one in Vegas, a, a ride, an Uber, and the lady was a teacher. She started at three o'clock after her school ended at two. And she had a, a scented mister that was in the a cigarette lighter. And I, it felt like I was in a spa. I didn't want to get out of the car. <laughs> but, you know, I, I've seen Uber drivers and Lyft drivers putting armor all on tires. Yep. They're cleaning the windows while they're waiting for me yep. to finish packing my luggage to come down. It, it's, it's pretty neat. Exactly. That five-star rating is extremely important to those guys. Yeah. Absolutely. So that actually kind of brings up a good, good point. Um, Dealers don't quite understand who the rideshare driver is. And I know for you personally talking to, to all the different dealer groups out there that, you know, convincing them that rideshare drivers are actually a good audience for them is very difficult because of that. Yeah, the perceptions, it's tough to change perception. Mm -hmm. And there were banks and dealers that did try to jump on this early 2012, 13, 14 which seems like yesterday, but it's still a four years ago, five longer. And and there's been that shift in the demographics. Mm -hmm. So, you know, drivers, here's the funny thing about dealerships. We look at miles on a car as a death sentence for a car's value. Mm -hmm. And we have to change the narrative that actually miles mean money. And we kind of coined... Uh, an expression that parallels with that, and that is revenue is the new odometer. Mm. And we look at, and uh, 
Actually, I, I think Nate inspired that a little bit. Love that. And it's, it's true, though, because if you think of any other industry, if you ran a hotel, you, you want every room filled, right, as often as possible. If you run a restaurant, you want all the tables filled. Mm -hmm. If you're in a dealership, why wouldn't you want someone to drive more miles because it's going to feed your parts and service department. And if you're getting revenue from those miles, long as it exceeds the depreciation, well, you're in heaven. And so we found out through the averages of statistics that, you know, Hire Car has been in business for over three years. So we have a lot of great data. And when I looked at it, it validated a lot of things that I felt were happening. And that is time was more of a depreciating factor than miles on a car. So I say to a dealer, you know, if they have a car on the lot for 90 days and the odometer doesn't change at all, what does it depreciate? Well, I know because I'm a dealer. I can give them the answer. <laughs> yep. It's about 20% in 90 days. So you take a $20,000 car, it can depreciate as much as $4,000 without changing any odometer. Wow. Now, you add 6,000 miles to that car in 90 days, the depreciation is about the same. So you, you're not earning revenue and the car is still depreciating. So what what is a model for the dealer that works? Because obviously, you know, losing four grand then having to wholesale the car is not something any dealer wants to do, right? But yet it happens every day. And I was a perfect example. Matter of fact, the controller would often say, here's your losses on 90 days. You need to sell the cars before that. And by the way, in addition to the depreciation, dealers typically pay a large incentive to the salesperson to sell it. Mm -hmm. So they have commission and that doesn't even include the marketing. Wow. So they're they're spending hundreds of dollars a week, if not in some cases a day, to merchandise these cars. If you add all the costs, this is why dealers struggle to make money, because idle inventory is not a plus. So I think to go back to your question, um, the the solution really is getting the vehicle out on the street, just like the airlines get their planes in the air. Airlines figured out a long time ago that they're losing money unless the plane is flying. Mm -hmm. That concept is difficult to initially digest for a dealer. And I say digest because it's like telling them they can eat pizza and lose weight. It just doesn't <laughs> make sense. Uh, so when we start with the phrase miles mean money, at least they listen because they think I'm an idiot. <laughs> and I go, remember, I was a dealer. Don't shoot me. Yep. Right. Let me walk you through this. And then I real they realize, yeah, you're right. I'm I'm losing that money whether the car's driven or not. Mm -hmm. But then something else we figured out: most of these drivers want to buy a car, and they'll buy the car they're renting. So that ends up being an incredible motivation for dealers. And once they see that really work, they put a lot more cars on the platform mm -hmm. yep. because they're turning, and the renter becomes a owner, and then becomes their service and parts department client. Gotcha. Awesome. Um, so I guess really this kind of creates a new opportunity for dealers to create a new way to sell a car, right? Um, and you know, every time you you give a, a big keynote, you always mention uh, an awesome graph uh, that you, you put together. Um, and what it shows is the shift in vehicle sales um, from personal to fleet sales. Um, can you explain a little bit how you see that shift in the future moving? Sure. Thank you. Uh, so what we know and a consensus of uh, new vehicle manufacturers, banks, and large third-party vendors uh, held a meeting at uh, NADA in 2019. They called it the Automotive News Retailer Seminar. And they showed data that Vehicle sales were going to decline over 10 years, only about 15%, not a big drop, not the end of the world. The car business survived the recession where there was a 50% drop. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't the story. Mm -hmm. The story was the shift in mix of fleet and retail of those overall sales. And that was the eye opener for dealers in the audience. The shift where retail one-to-one -one sales, what you and I would go to a car dealership and buy a car, was going to drop from 15.4 million to 8.9 by 2028. Now that itself is almost a 50% drop. That's the one that's worrisome. Mm -hmm. The counterbalance to that is the fleet sales 
are projected to grow. And by the way, this is already happening. Four months later, I'll, I'll give you the numbers in a second. From January, uh, we're already seeing this trend manifesting. But the, the sales by large fleet owners was going to grow significantly, but the dealers would not benefit from that unless they got into the market of selling these fleets to either rideshare drivers and or the larger companies themselves. Right. And so I guess this is where the other mobility companies come into play, right? Correct. So you have you have some pretty large investment houses out there that are talking about investing in a, in a new version of some sort of vehicle exchange program. Mm -hmm. But again, they've got to spend a lot of money to duplicate the, the resources and the footprint that dealers and the OEMs already have. So what that graph showed that was the eye opener for the dealers is the smart ones need to get in early mm -hmm. for their markets to own the fleet and be an on-demand transportation provider. So the narrative to the story that you um, did, were talking about what I share with the audience is dealers need to get in the whole ecosystem to provide a vehicle no matter how a consumer wants to uh, consume transportation, mm -hmm. whether they want to buy a car, finance it, lease it, rent it, or use it on demand and give it back once or twice a week. And that's where the dealer's real pivot needs to occur for them to survive and adapt. Got it. Okay. Well, that kind of leads me to another question, or I guess it's like a two-part question. Um, I guess, so how big is that shift for the car dealer in order to, to get in to the on-demand service or the ride-sharing industry? So it's more of a mental shift by far than a physical shift. Okay. Most dealerships have a loaner or a rental car department already. Oddly, that's exactly what mobility is. Mm -hmm. It's giving somebody another car to use that's not theirs. And whether it's for a day or an hour, dealers are really already doing it, but they're not satisfying the demand from the ride share community or the transportation on demand community. And what that is just to define for the audience, Grubhub, DoorDash, Amazon Flex. Mm -hmm. A lot of dealers think that uh, mobility is just putting people in cars and driving around through the Uber or Lyft app. Know that actually a larger segment is food and package delivery. And the dealers are in the perfect position to provide vehicles, vans, fleet, even pickup trucks. You know, mm -hmm. Home Depot, for a long time, you could rent a pickup truck by the hour. Mm -hmm. Home Depot was in mobility before people knew what mobility <laughs> was. Exactly. So dealers are the natural to be in that. Right. Especially any dealer that has a franchise that includes vans or pickup trucks. Gotcha. Excellent. Um, Brian, you know, that, thank you so much. You know, My every time, every time we get to hear you talk, it's always, uh, you know, kind of a brain dump yeah. or a, a wisdom bomb, <laughs> as they would say. It's awesome. All right. Well, if you just tell my wife that, I'd really appreciate it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'll put in a good word for you. <laughs> Thank um, you very much. Yeah. It was, it was great to have you on the show. Um, and join us next week as we have Joe Frenari, CEO of Hire Car, uh, on Mobility Revolution, powered by Hire Car. Cool. Fabulous. Thanks, Brian. Thank, Thank you, you, gentlemen.